Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to the last Sunday of this month. We thank you for being with us throughout last week. And as we begin the last Sunday in July, we pray that you may continue to guide us with your mighty hand. And as we gather together in our respective places to worship you and glory for your name this morning, we pray that you may accept our praises and our thanksgiving. We remember our youth members this day very specially as we celebrate Youth Sunday today. We commit all the youth members of our church, Egmore Wesley Church and Broadway English Wesley Church. We commit all of them in your hands. We commit their future. We pray that you may make them great leaders of your church and great leaders of this world. Be with us throughout this service. Bless this service. Through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, we pray. Let us all praise God by singing the hymn 247, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Hymn number 247.
Let us pray. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sinning. Let us examine ourselves in silence. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto us pardon and remission of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we shall have the first lesson. The first lesson is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 1 to 9. Ezekiel, chapter 33, beginning from verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from among them and make them their watchmen, and if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, and does not blow the trumpet, so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Now we shall listen to the second lesson. Today's epistle reading is taken from the first letter of Paul to Timothy, Chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. The first letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. The saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace and into the snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be serious, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, and not greedy for money. They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them be first tested 
Then, if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Women, likewise, must be serious, not slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be married only once, and let them manage their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good understanding for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Here ends the epistle reading. Praise be to God. Now we shall have the responsive reading. The responsive reading is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 99, beginning to read from verse 1. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is exalted over all the people. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity, you have excused justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was also among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You are a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Here ends the responsive reading. Glory be to the Father, Son and to the Spirit. Now let us all sing together the hymn 585, Rise Up, O Men of God, hymn number 585. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate Youth Sunday. Usually we celebrate Youth Sunday in the month of June or July. Though we are not able to come together as one family to worship God under one roof, we are able to remember our youth members and we know that God has a plan for them and they are going to become the future leaders of our church. And today, we have the recorded message for our youth. I requested Mr. Wilson Jabaraj, who is in Mumbai, 
to send his recorded message for our youth members. And he has kindly consented to record his message for this Sunday. And we are going to listen to the word of God. He is going to deliver God's message to the youth and to all of us. Let's pray. morning. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you've given us to come into your presence. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us in a new and a special way. Father, we pray, O oh God, that you would open our eyes, that we would see wondrous truths from your word. Open our ears, that we would hear from you. Open our hearts, that we would receive you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank the pastor, the LCC, and the Youth Fellowship for giving me this opportunity to share God's word with you. Uh, it's a joy and a privilege for me to be here and to share God's word with you. He was just a few days old when a lo local soothsayer met his parents to say the dreaded words that this child will not live beyond one year. You, need, you see, Sudalai was the eighth child in the family Five of the earlier children had died as unnatural deaths. He came from a generation of people who used to eat food offered to the dead. Most of the family members died unnatural deaths. His father had three sisters and all three had unnatural deaths. One sister drowned in a well, one sister hung herself, and the third sister had food poison and she died. This is the story of Sudalai, born in a small village in Benghazi. The soothsayer had said, as long as Sudalai lives, there is a curse on this family and this family will not uh, succeed. This was working in the back of his parents' minds. So they decided to go to various temples and do penance. But nothing happened. He lived up to 14 years old. But in the back of his parents' mind was this feeling that the curse was upon this family. So when he was 14, they sent him to Chennai. He goes to Chennai and he lives alone. He was already feeling homesick. One day he was walking down Chennai flyover where he met a kind man who spoke to him kindly and then handed over a book to him. And he told him that this book will speak to you. This book will protect you. He took that book, put it in his pocket, and he started walking. He had never been to a church, so he did not know about Jesus. Never been to a church, so he had never seen a Bible. The, what the man had given him was a copy of a New Testament. He took this and he went to his friend's room even as he was entered the friend's room, his friend was a soothsayer himself. And as he entered the room, he saw all the elements that his friend had used the previous night. 
to call the spirits for his soothsaying. As soon as uh, Sodala entered the room, the spirit was disturbed and this friend of his realized that the spirit was disturbed and had left that place. So he asked uh, Sodala, did you go to a church? And Sodala said, no, I haven't been to a church. And after some time, his friend said, what is that in your pocket? He picked up and gave the book to him. He looked at it, it was a Bible. He immediately realized that it's because of this Bible that the spirit had left. And so he flung the Bible out of the window. After spending some time with his friend, Sudalai decided to go back to his room. So as he was leaving, he went out, he realized that this book had some power. So he picked the book and took it to his room. And then he started reading the Bible. The Lord spoke to him through the Bible and he gave his life to Jesus. Today, Samson Money, that's his name now, he's the area director of North Chennai camp of Gideons. He has distributed over three lakh Bibles over a period of time. Lena and I had the privilege of meeting with him last October in Chennai. And when we were talking to him, even as we spoke to him, we asked him and he was telling us that we have a very short life. In the short life, it is important that we share the love of Jesus to as many as we can and take along with us as many people as we can. And he said at that given point of time that he had led 52 people in his family to the Lord. And he also said that his mother, when she was 78 years old, gave her life to Jesus before she died. A life transformed. Sudalai, who became Samson Money, a life transformed by the power of Jesus, is today transforming lives. The topic for today's message is transform to transform. Transform to transform. And the passage that was given to us is from John chapter 21, Ezekiel chapter 33. We would look at these two passages. Apart from this, we will also look at Luke chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 4. And if you look at it, here it talks about Peter. And Peter is one of my favorite characters as well. Because, you know, I can identify myself with Peter. I'm sure all of us will identify ourselves with Peter. Peter was an into cutlet or a very enthusiastic person. He had a foot in his mouth disease. Even before anyone could say he would be the first one to give out an answer. When he saw a huge catch of fish, he was so excited. When he saw Jesus walking on the water, he had the same zeal. He cries out to Jesus, Lord, help, let me also walk on water. And Jesus says, come on. And he starts walking. And then comes his humanness, just like we are. He starts looking around at the waves and he starts to drown and he cries out to Jesus. And then Jesus saves him. The same Peter told the Lord, whatever happens, I will not let go of you. Even if everyone else does, I will be with you. And then on that eventful night, he denies Jesus three times. So very like me, how very often I let this Jesus down. So I can identify myself with Peter. I'm sure each of us listening to this would also be able to identify ourselves with the life of Peter. I've just divided this morning's message into three parts. The first part is the choice of God. The second is the confession. And the third is the call of God. When you look at the choice of God, let's turn with me to, you know, John chapter 21. Let's read the first few verses of that particular chapter as well. We started from verse 15, but let's read the initial few verses as well. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, they were. And the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. 
Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, the answer. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coal there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. If you look at this passage in the first two verses, along with Peter, there were six other disciples with him or six other disciples were there. So there were seven of them. But look at verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Simon, son of John. He's not called him Peter here. He's calling him in his old name, Simon. And he's very specific. The call of God is very specific. He calls, picks up Simon. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 5, and if you read through the first few verses, you will find there as well that, you know, there were two boats. And God, and the Bible says, he got into one of the boats. Let's just look at that. Luke chapter 5 it says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing the nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. He got into one of the boats. The Bible could have stopped by saying he got into one of the boats. But instead, it says, got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. God's call is specific. Even this morning, God is calling each and every one of you each and every one of us. He's interested in us. He's calling us by name. Right through the Bible, if you see, God calls people specifically. He picked up Joseph from all, among all his brothers. He picked up Moses. He didn't pick up Aaron or anyone else. He picked up Moses. If you look through, he picked up David, a shepherd. Among all his brothers, he picked up David. If you go through the New Testament again, God is a God who picks up people and it is very specific. He calls each of them by name. When he called the disciples, he called them by name. James, Andrew, John, come follow me. Come follow me. The call is the same today. The call is the same today. God is choosing you and me. He's very specific in his call. I'm not too sure where you are, in what situation you are in. But I want to tell you this morning, Jesus is calling you. He's calling me. He's very specific. And when he calls, he not only calls the people who are very qualified, well-educated. He does pick them up. But also, if you look through the Bible, he picks up ordinary people. He picked up Peter, who was just a fisherman. He picked up Moses, who was a stammerer. He picked up David, who was a shepherd. He picked up Joseph, who was a dreamer. Go into the New Testament, you'll find this. N number of times, God picking ordinary people. Jeremiah, again, person who could not speak. God picks him up. God is a God who specializes in picking up ordinary people. 
And that's why when 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, 27, 28 talks about God chooses the weak things of the world to confirm the strong and the foolish things of this world to confirm the wise. Maybe you're sitting here and saying, what use am I? I'm not talented. I don't have this ability. I can't do this. I can't do that. But I want to tell you this morning, God's choice is specific. He's calling you. He loves you. He wants you. You know, when he calls you, he calls you with by name. And he's interested in your life. He's a God who loves us with an everlasting love. No matter what situation you are in, no matter how many times you have let him down, God is a God who's full of love. He comes seeking after us and he calls each of us. This morning, would you say yes to this call of God, this choice of God when he's calling you? Would you tell him, yes, Lord, I hear your call. Maybe so far I've let not followed you. But this morning, I want to tell you, Lord, I want to follow you. That's what Jesus did in Luke chapter 5 and then in Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus called Peter, he says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And in uh, John chapter 21 as well, after he asks Peter those three questions, he says, follow me, follow me. Are you and I willing to follow him? Are you and I willing to say yes to Jesus this morning? You know, when uh, Peter, you know, saw those huge catch of fish, he goes and falls at Jesus' face and says, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm a sinner. Depart from me, Lord. But the beauty of God is he doesn't go. He doesn't go. He loves Peter. He stays on. And if you look through the Bible, that's what he does right through. As he was walking on the road, he came to a sycamore tree. And suddenly he stopped and he looked up and he called, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your house today. Very specific. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and he was the worst tax collector. He was the king of tax collectors. But God chose him. God goes to his house. He picks up Mary, who was possessed with evil spirits. He picked up Lazarus, a man who was dead. A God is a God who specializes in picking up people who are broken or down. The same God this morning is saying, the God who picked up Peter is here this morning and saying, I'm choosing you. Wilson, I'm calling you. Whatever is your name? Jesus is saying, I'm interested in you. In 1 Peter 2.10, it says, once I was not a people, but now I'm a child of God. Once I had not received mercy, but now I have received mercy. You know, um, many years ago, after I finished my schooling in Chennai, I went to Coimbatore to do my studies. People in Chennai, and especially even in this church, would have thought that I was a good guy. Well, I pretended to be good. I was staying at home. But once I moved into a hostel in Coimbatore, life was not the same. I had to share a room with two others. The habit of reading the Bible and praying had gone, except on Sundays, which I used to take my Bible. I didn't you know, bother about the Bible or reading the Bible or praying. I felt busy to kneel down and pray, and so I wasn't. Very soon after my first semester, the Bible went into my trunk, and they never came out. A couple of years later, I received a letter from a friend of mine with a verse that said, there is no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. By then, I had moved far away from God. Not that I smoked, not that I drank. You know, and most people think smoking and drinking are the only two sins, not necessary. Whenever I used to speak in college, in a hostel, if you didn't start and end a sentence with Phil, you, you know, you're, you're nobody. And so, you know, I start a sentence with Phil, end a sentence with Phil, and that's how I lived. But when I came to Chennai on holidays, people thought I was still a saint. But deep down, I knew what I was. If my friends defied me to do something, then I'd want to do it. They would tell me, Wilson, you can't copy in this test. This guy will catch you. And then, you know, I'll want to prove it to them. So this became 
my sort of a lifestyle. But that night I knew that I was not right. And this verse, there is no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus, spoke to me. After my roommates had gone to sleep, I opened up my trunk, picked up my Bible, which I had not touched for a couple of years, and then started searching for this verse. Even as I searched, God started speaking to me through the pages of the Bible. I was crying. No one knew it. And I didn't go to bed till I found the verse. I'm sure most of you know where this verse is. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 1, which says, There is no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. In that hostel bed that night, I told the Lord, Lord, take over, Lord. I tried to live my life on my own terms, but I know, Lord, the life that I'm now living is not pleasing. It's not pleasing even to my conscience. Please, Lord, help me. That night, Jesus came in. He took control of my life. A couple of days later, my roommates uh, sensed that something was wrong with me. So they kept asking me, Wilson, what's wrong with you? I said, why nothing is wrong with me? They said, no, Wilson, you're not the same. I said, why am I not the same? They said, Wilson, you know, you're not speaking the same way you speak. And I knew God had changed my tongue. You know, overnight, God had removed every filth out of my mouth. God had changed my tongue. Not that I'm perfect. God is still working in my life. Not that I've not let him down. I, like Peter, have let him down many times over the last so many years. But one thing, the God whom we serve is a loving God. He's always waiting with his arms open wide. And he loves us. Whatever happens, he's just waiting. He didn't let go of Peter. After he denied him, he was still waiting for him. That's the same God. The first point, the God whose choice is specific. He calls you right now by your name. He's calling you wherever you are, whatever situation you are in. I want to tell you, God just wants you. That leads me to the next point, which is the confession. There are two things that happens in his life. And I want to share both. One is a positive and the other is a negative. The positive is what we find in Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. But it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Who answers here? Simon Peter. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. A choice that led to a transformation, then led to a confession that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, that's what would happen to you, a natural progression. The choice of God will transform your life. Once you're transformed, all that you and I can say is talk about the Messiah. Talk about this Jesus, the God who changed our life. I believe that the Jews used to pray thanking God for three things every morning. Those three things were, Lord, I thank you that I'm not a Samaritan. Lord, I thank you that I'm not a slave. Lord, I thank you, I'm not a woman. Not that this prayer was right, but this was one of the way it was so many years ago. Women were considered very low down the pecking order of the Jewish society. And yet, just look at this. Peter, a proud, obstinate, independent Galilean Jew, was speaking to a servant girl. Let's just look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. To 75. Just turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 to 75. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were the Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you are talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people that this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Two times, two girls. Here was Peter, a strong Jew, 
but in front of two girls, he denies them. Then he went out of the gateway, denied him. Okay, he denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call on curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus has spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. At one point, he was confessing that Jesus was the Messiah. And if you look at Matthew chapter 26, here he was, even afraid of a slave girl. The man who told Jesus, whatever happens, I'm willing to come with you. Whatever will be the cost? In front of a slave girl, denying Jesus. The first time he denies Jesus, you know, he says, uh, starts up with, he says in this passage, he knew Jesus. He did not know Jesus. And then he denies again with an oath in verse 72. And then again in verse 74, he denies calling on curses on himself. And immediately the cock crows. Jesus turns and looks at Peter. I'm not too sure what that look was, but Peter and Jesus knew that look. The man who told Jesus, whatever will be the cost, I will be with you. Whatever happens, Lord, I will be with you. And Peter knew the comment that he had made. And here he was denying Jesus three times. I'm not too sure in our work, work with God, in our journey, where you are right now. Maybe many years ago, you gave your heart to Jesus. Your life was transformed. And then you confess that Jesus was Lord. But somewhere along the line, like Peter, we've let him down. And we've moved away. And we're far away from Jesus right now. This morning, I want to tell you, this Jesus is still ever waiting with his love, with his arms open, waiting for us. You know, we compromise so easily. There are times that we do things that we should not be doing. And sometimes those sins that hold us, you know, prevents us from being what we should be. You know, it doesn't let us soar like an eagle because the devil keeps on pointing his finger at us and keeps saying, are you the one who's going to talk about the Messiah? Are you the one who's going to share the love of Jesus? You know, maybe Peter should have been bold. Maybe Peter should have prayed a little bit more. Maybe Peter should have taken a stand. But he let Jesus down. Could be the same with us. Maybe we have started going to places where we should not go. Maybe we are speaking the things that we should not be speaking. But I want to tell you this morning. If only we can, like Peter, tell him, Lord, I'm sorry. There was once... I was following you, but now, Lord, I moved away. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Two people denied, or two people did things that day which were not right. Judas Iscariot and Peter. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. But you know what? Peter went out and cried, wept, and asked God for forgiveness. Whereas Judas did not. He went out. And he hanged himself. This morning, you know, God is here. And God says in Psalm 19, verse 12, Who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Also in Romans chapter 5, it says, for I do not do the things I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. King David had his weakness. Peter had his weakness. We have our weaknesses too. But when you look at John chapter 21, you know, it reminds us of the love of Jesus. If you look at John chapter 21, you know, 
after they catch the fish and Jesus at the shore, he could have looked at Peter and told him, Peter, do you remember what you told me and what you did? But instead, if you look at it, you know, he was there at the shore with fish and bread, or rather fish and chips, waiting for them. He did not remind him. It's the same God. Oh, what a savior. He doesn't point at our mistakes. He just loves us. He just loves us. The first is the choice of God. Second, the confession. Confession first, that he's the Messiah. And then after he had compromised and denied Jesus, he goes back and confesses his sins, weeps bitterly, and sets his relationship right with Jesus. Maybe this morning, maybe you don't Jesus. And now you moved away. Maybe this is a time for you to tell the Lord, Lord, I want you back in my life. I want you to transform my life one more time, Lord. I want to give my life to you. I don't want to live this way. I want to take control of my life. And I want to promise you, God will take control of your life. He will change your life. He will make you into a new creation. Old things will pass away. Behold, all things will become new. That's the God who we worship. A God who's interested in changing our lives. A God who transforms our life. The first point, the choice of God. The second point, the confession of Peter as a Messiah and also of his sins. And the last one, the call of God. If you look at John chapter 21, if you, if you read those verses from 15 onwards, you know, it says in John chapter 21, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lamb. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, if you look at this passage, the first two times when Jesus says, do you love me? The love that God uses there is agape love, unconditional love. But the reply that Peter gives is, Lord, I love you, which is a filial love, which is a brotherly love. I love you like a friend. Jesus is asking me, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter is saying, I love you like a friend. That was the first two times. The third time, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you truly love me like a friend? And that's when Peter gets angry and says, Lord, you know it all too well. I love you, Lord, as a friend. If you look at this Bible passage, three times Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? There's something significant about this. Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me three times? And then if you look at, you know, it's not just these two instances. There's one more instance in Acts chapter 10. When uh, Peter was, you know, went up to the terrace to pray. And then he went into a trance. And he was uh, you know, sleeping or he was you know, in a trance. When he sees a blanket coming down from heaven with all sorts of animals on it. And the voice coming up to him and saying, you know, cut these animals and eat. And Peter said, Lord, never will I do something like that. And it comes to, it happens three times again. There's something specific about that three times in Peter's life. Maybe there's something that God's trying to tell each of us this morning. Maybe he's been knocking on us for many days, for many years, many months. Maybe he's saying, hey, I want you to you know, not just be transformed, but I want you to follow me, to make fishers of men. And maybe you're not. You know, if you look at it, you know, God, Jesus tells Peter, feed my sheep. It's not Peter's sheep, it's God's sheep. 
and God has created this entire universe and all the people that he's created, he has created in his image and he loves each of them. And the reason why he's made you and me or he's transformed you and me is so that we can reach out to these people whom he has created in his own image. Now this morning, your God is asking, are you willing to reach out to those people around you? Your servant at home, your driver, your friends in school or college or in your work spot, your colleague in your work spot. Have you shared the love of Jesus to them? If your life has been transformed, you and I should be transforming other lives. That's what Jesus told uh, Peter, tend my sheep, take care of my sheep, feed them. Are you talking to them about the love of Jesus? Once transformed, we need to be transforming lives. What will be the cost? You and I should be willing to be transformed, to transform lives. We know the story of Graham Staines and his two sons. We've seen those uh, movies as well. What a life. A man who came down from Australia to India to work among the tribal people. He was ready to lay down his life. In the current situation, I'm not too sure what you're going through, what pains you're going through, what are the strains that you are having. But I want to tell you this morning, there is a God who loves us. And he's saying, if you have known him, he's saying, what are you going to do for me? Are you willing to talk about Jesus to your friends? Are you willing to reach out to the people who haven't heard the gospel? You know, in fact, when uh, God picks up Peter and, you know, he takes him for a walk sort of a thing. And then he asks these questions. That's the same God. He's walking with you. He's talking to you this morning. And he's asking you, would you tend my sheep? Would you feed my sheep? It's not necessary that, you know, you've got to be a pastor. You've got to be a lay preacher. You've got to be someone. No. Wherever you are. God wants to use you. God wants to use you just as you are to share the love of Jesus. Are we willing to share the love of Jesus? He's here this morning, challenging you and to me, asking this question, would you feed my sheep? He told Peter, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. That's the same call this morning as well. He wants to make us fishers of men. The great commission that he gets given us is go ye into the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them. And that's the call for you and for me, that we got to preach the gospel. If you can't preach the gospel, at least you can share the gospel with your friend. Talk to your friend about the love of Jesus. Talk to your family members who haven't known Jesus about the love of Jesus. I want to close with a true life story of a pastor and his family who lived in Korea. You know, uh, this was during the Korean uh, war. Christian preachers were being targeted. In a, such a tense situation, group of 40 communists kidnapped a preacher, his wife and two children. They took them to the outskirts of the city. They attempted to force the preacher to deny Christ and swear that he will no longer preach that Christ is Lord. But the preacher refused. They threatened him saying that they would bury him, his wife and children alive. But the preacher did not budge. As if to prove that they were serious, they started digging a hole right in front of them. But they would not get a word out of him. This aroused their anger. They were very angry. And they placed his family in the hole and began playing on his emotions. Because of his stubbornness, your innocent children are going to die right in front of your own eyes. Deny Christ and we shall leave you. But the preacher did not relent. Finally, they started filling up the hole. Still, the preacher remained unmoved. The hole was filled up gradually until the children were to be covered. The preacher started shaking. He was torn between emotions. 
the cries of his little children moved him. But realizing this, the preacher's wife looked at him and told him, Within a little while, we shall all be with our Lord forever. Be bold and do not give up. These words encouraged him and he did not relent. As a result, all of them were buried alive. The news of this tragedy shook many. The Christians of South Korea were shaken. Why did God allow this to happen? The preacher preached about Christ. He was killed. What wrong did his wife and children do? These were the questions that rent the air. The remaining preachers found it difficult to answer these questions. Years rolled by. There was a time of great revival in South Korea. This was a time when the renowned preacher, Paul Young Ki Chow, was a pastor of the biggest congregation in the world. One day during a service, a man rose up and told the surprised audience that he was one among the 40 persons who buried the preacher and his family, and he proceeded to share the details of the sad incident. He said that he was moved by the courage and conviction of the preacher who did not deny Christ even at the point of death. He wanted to know who that Jesus was, and in that process, he was convicted and had accepted Christ as his savior. Moreover, all the 40 involved in that incident had also come to know the Lord Jesus as their personal savior, and they were part of Paul Young Show's church. It took many years to understand why God had permitted that incident. God had used the death of those four people to save 40 more. Martyrs of Christ are never buried. They are sown. Peter was again a martyr. They wanted to crucify Peter as well. Then Peter told them, I don't deserve to die the way my master died. I'd rather be hanged or crucified upside down. And that's what history says, that Peter was crucified upside down. Are we bold enough to share the love of Jesus? Come what may? Do we have the love and the compassion for people around us that we want to take them along with us and we go to heaven? Are we just content with us just knowing Jesus? Samson Money, just one man. 52 in his family have come to know the Lord. Can you and I say, because of me, so many have come to know the Lord. Transform to transform. That's the call of Jesus this morning. He used Peter to transform lives. If you look into Acts, you will find in one portion in Acts where Peter went and preached the gospel and two entire villages were turned to Jesus. Are you and I willing to go and share the love of Jesus to others? If not, maybe God's calling us this morning and saying, will you come and work along with me to change lives? Being transformed alone is not enough. We need to be transforming others as well. That's the call. Three things. The choice. Specific call. God's calling you. Wherever you are sitting, God's calling you. The confession. That Jesus is the Lord. In case you have moved away from him, just as Peter wept bitterly, would you go out and cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, cleanse me, Lord. I need you one more time being transformed, would you be like Peter who went out and started winning people for Jesus? You know the story of Peter in the prison. You will know all that he has done. If you read Acts chapter 1 or 2 onwards, you would see that. The story of Peter right up to chapter 11 or chapter 12. Are we be like Peter ready to share the love of Jesus with others? Transform to transform. Shall we just pray? Father, we just want to thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Thank you, Lord, for your love that bought us. Father, even right now, we pray, Lord, that being transformed, Lord, we want to transform lives. We want to be your vessels that can be used of you. Just as you call Peter, to be fishers of men. You're calling each of us to be fishers of men. I pray, Lord, that each of us, Lord, 
would be bold and brave to share your love. Lord, that we would bring many into your kingdom before we meet you. We thank you, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. We are weak. But thank you, Lord, for the assurance that you are with us. You will never leave us. You are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Lord, with that assurance, we want to say, Lord, yes, Lord. We want to follow you. We want to do what you want us to do, Lord. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Wilson, for accepting my invitation and my request. Thank you for sharing the word of God with us this morning. May God bless you and your family. Take care and continue to pray for us as we pray for you. Let us profess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Now, Mr. Joshua Ebenezer, Convener Youth Fellowship, will offer a special prayer for our youth. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before you through your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, not just his life on earth, but the gift of life eternal. Lord, on this Youth Sunday, we come especially for the youths of our church, not just of our church, but of the state, of the nation, and of the world. Lord God, we pray especially for each and every youth of our church, namely Adam, Sarah, Alice, Bernice, Darshan, Asha, Joanne, Joanna, Sam Emmanuel, Vanya, Sajina, Karen, Rebecca, Asha, Mariam, Moses, Alan, Jerome, Kiran, Sujit, Anand, Roshni, Nitin, Neeti, Nikhil, Joshua Livingston, Neil, Jayant, Aditya, Kim, Amuta, Ajita, Bharat, Paul, Anup, Sam, Samson, Varsha, and every other youth, O oh Lord, of our church. Lord God, we see in Acts 1.8, O oh Lord, that how the disciples spread the word from Jerusalem, Judah, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, we pray, O oh Father Lord, that you would e use each and every youth of our church, O oh Lord, to spread the word of God in our church, in our city, in our state, in our nation and to the ends of the world. Lord God, we pray, O oh Father Lord, that as Paul writes in 1 Timothy 4.12, where he says, O oh Lord, do not let anyone look down on your youth, but with the grace of the Holy Spirit and as believers of the Holy Spirit, may we set an example in conduct, speech, love, faith, and purity. Lord God, we pray, O oh Father Lord, that you would give us the grace, O oh Father Lord, to do exactly this, O oh Father Lord, and may we make people realize our purity and our desire to work for you and for your glory through our speech and conduct, Lord. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us, O oh Lord, and we have not chosen you as we see in John 15, 16, O oh Father Lord. We pray, O oh Father Lord, that as God's chosen people, O oh Lord, we would clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Lord God, we pray, O oh Father Lord, that we would be build repairers and bridge builders for the youth of our state and our country and of the world. Lord God, we pray especially, O oh Father Lord, that each of us would be a Daniel, O oh Father Lord, a Moses, O oh Father Lord, who would not give in to the pressures of the world, Lord, 
and walk away from your sight, O oh Father Lord, but always walk in your sight, O oh Father Lord, though it would involve going into the lion's den or being put in the burning furnace, O oh Father Lord. Lord God, we pray at this point for our church and for our different ministries of our church. Lord God, we pray for all the doctors, nurses, and all those who are involved in this tough times, O oh Lord, working in the health care, O oh Father Lord. We pray, O oh Father Lord, that you would use us, O oh Father Lord, in whatever way is possible, O oh Father Lord, to do great things for your glory in these tough times, O oh Father Lord. Lord God, we pray for the poor, the sick, the needy, the dying. Lord God, we pray, O oh Father Lord, that Jehovah Jireh would provide, O oh Father Lord, in these tough days, O oh Father Lord. We pray, O oh Father Lord, when the world, when the scientists have no answers, O oh Father Lord, for what is happening across the world, that the Lord would provide answers, O oh Father Lord, so that we, would, we could all come, O oh Father Lord, and worship your name together in the house that the Lord has built us, O oh Father Lord. We make this prayer in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Joshua, for that wonderful prayer. Now we shall have the announcements. Once again, I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I greet all the members who celebrate the birthdays and wedding anniversary this week. May God bless them and give them good health, strength and long life. Let us continue to pray for our church ministries, for all the members of Igmore Wesley Church and Broadway English Wesley. Let us very specially commit our elders and children in the hands of God. Let us also pray for doctors, nurses and all health workers who risk their life in serving the people who are infected with coronavirus. Let us also pray for the peace of the whole world. I am happy to inform you that Mr. Lawrence Ranjit Raj and his wife Krishna Devi are blessed 
with a baby boy on the 5th of May. May the good Lord bless the little one and we welcome the little one into our midst. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for our youth members. We commit them very specially in your hands on this day. We thank you for the talents that you have given them. We pray that you may give them a bright future. Give them enough opportunities to ex exhibit their talents. We commit all of them in your hands on this very special day so that they'll be faithful to your church and work for the development of your church and for the extension of your kingdom. We pray for the members who celebrate the birthdays and wedding anniversaries this week. Give them good health to the Lord. Fulfill all your plans and purposes in and through their life. We pray for the peace of the whole world. We pray for peace between India and China, India and Pakistan. We pray for peace all over the world. We pray for all the doctors and nurses, very especially doctors and nurses from our church, health workers from our church, who work in different hospitals, during this pandemic. Protect them under holy wings. Give them good health. We pray for our children and for the future. We commit them and their studies and the future in your hands, O oh Lord. Be with us throughout this week and as we begin a new month on the last day of this week, we pray that you may continue to guide us with your mighty hand. Help us to begin a new month with your power and strength so that we can understand your will for us and for the whole world. We ask this in the sweet and precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let us all say in unison, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Let us sing together the hymn 569, Thine Forever, God of Love. Hymn number 569.
the lord be with you go in peace to love and serve the lord in the name of christ amen god bless you